All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. You are welcome to the Diary of Hackers section. This is a cyber talk. And um, today we'll be talking about email security, how to analyze email, uh, as well as um, how to find threats to email and how to analyze um, emails that seems like a threat to the organizational um, email assets. So taking us on this discussion today is an expert, um, Mr. Salma Lenagise is a uh, systems engineer with Fortinet. If you know Fortinet is one of the global brand that deals with um, um, cybersecurity um, solutions. So we are so, so privileged to have him in our midst today. He has 15 years of experience in information technology. Um, thank you so much, Steph, for coming on the show today. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to you. Yes, sir. So if you don't mind, you can uh, start the session. So <laughs> if you just come in, you're welcome. Just take a seat and um, take your notes, take your paper, take your pen, and uh, make sure you learn a lot. It's very important. This topic is a very important topic because you don't know where you find yourself uh, in any organization, and you don't know the kind of tax that you'll be given once you start a new role in any organization. So it's very important that at least email security is something that every cybersecurity, if not every cybersecurity professional, but at least if you, if you call yourself a cybersecurity person, you should be able to recognize that oh, this email should be a threat to an organization. So um, thank you so much again, sir, for coming and um, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Joshua. Um, hi, guys. My name is Sam, like um, Joshua, as I said. I work with Fortinet. I am a cyber security professional like you guys. I'm your comrade. I'm your son. So I'm one of you. And um, this is... Hello. This is a good medium, right, to, for us to share uh, knowledge. Okay, so today I'll be talking about the, the email security. And essentially, we're going to look at ways of um, mitigating threats that comes into our email infrastructure, right? So a lot of people think it's just about the sophisticated bit, but they forget the user end, and it's going to be one of the things that um, we we'll talk about. So the agenda for this meeting um, is first we'll, look at, we'll have a look at um, how email work generally, of course. That will give us a sense of purpose, yeah? Um, we're going to look at business drivers behind uh, protecting our email infrastructure. We're going to take a look at the threat landscape. Um, so what this means is we're going to take a look at threats that um, often comes with um, our emails. And finally, we going to look at ways of protecting um, email infrastructure. Okay, so without further ado, let's get right into it. According to statistics out there, right, uh, email remains the number one attack vector in the world. So what this simply means is that email is the number one medium through which threats are delivered to your network, whether they are corporate, whether they are personal, email remains number one medium through which threats are discovered or are delivered. Um, according to Verizon, uh, they said 92.4% of emails are delivered, of malware are delivered through email, and 49% of malware is installed through email attachments. So um, I think that goes a long way to show the sensitivity of uh, um, the emails generally. Uh, again, according to the FBI, they said about $3.3 billion have been lost to email attacks. And that was between 2016 and 2018. So, of course, we should know what the, that gives us an idea of what the current value should be at the moment. Now, these statistics were not released externally just shows that you have to put in effort to um, protect your email infrastructure. Like I mentioned before, um, a lot of organizations um, think 
pretty no for setting up um, sophisticated systems is good enough to protect your email infrastructure why they forget the beyond it um, like the same goes users or customers or clients are the weakest link in your network and so you also have to have a robust awareness and training program for them you need to teach them how to identify malicious emails you have to teach them how to identify safe emails so that's another angle a lot of organizations are missing. But of course, we'll take a look at some other um, sophisticated methods of doing that. First, let's define what email is. Email is simply a method of exchanging digital messages between parties, right? So if you have used the post office before, that should give you an idea of how email works. So you take your letter or whatever package you have, you go to a post office, you get it delivered, you buy your stamps. Of course, that has to indicate where that particular email or that particular letter or package is going to, right? Then that post office delivers your mail to the you know, uh, destination you have indicated. It delivers it to the post office in the other location, right? Then that post office delivers to the recipient. That is no different from how email works. Yeah, and we'll take a look at that very shortly. And a bit of history here. Email, the email was invented at MIT, that's the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1965. Um, Originally, it used the FTP protocol for uh, operation. Um, so what that means is, if we are not familiar with this protocol, it's called the file transfer protocol. So it's used by a lot of persons, organizations, to transfer large files from one party to another. So what this means in the email context was that the original email infrastructure or email program was designed to use the FTP protocol for sending and receiving files. But it wasn't sustainable because it had a drawback and this was supposed to be deployed on a central disk. So what, what this means is it had a user remotely log into an email system whose um, main structure was dependent on the FTP. Of course, you, you can imagine how large that central is going to be for everyone to log to uh, send emails and then, of course, try to attach files and the likes of it. So that was switched for the SMTP protocol, which is the simple mail transfer protocol, which uses a store and forward method for delivering emails. And that is what we use today. Right. So what happens is we have mail servers that take the review of emails sent by users and then tries to send it across either locally or publicly through the internet. So this is just a summary of how the email works and a bit of history about it. So what components make up the email infrastructure, right? I'm sure we've all sent emails at one point or another in our lives. But again, a lot of us might not know how it works. So what you have on the screen is just giving you an idea of how the email um, infrastructure or email technology works. Normally, you have a sender who tries to send an email. This can be done to any of your phones, your laptops, and the likes of it. Then you have a software, right, that is installed on your system. The most popular one is the Microsoft Outlook. These softwares are called mail user agents. They are used to send emails from our systems to our recipient's systems, right? So either you install this software on your system, right? Or you could use web services, which are also very popular, like your Yahoo Mail, your Gmail, ETC. 
Once that email is sent from your system, it is sent to a mail transfer agent. So this bot or this program takes delivery of the emails that are sent from your users or from your own end. Remember in the previous slide, I talked about SMTP and taking delivery of emails, right? And I also said that it uses a store and forward method. So it is these mail transfer agents, right? That takes delivery of those mails. There's also always a threshold that is built that the mail transfer agent can um, the amount of emails that no transfer agent can send at the time. Once that is exceeded, then it queues up your email, right? If the recipient of that particular mail, that's wherever you are delivering that email to, is within the same network or within the same domain, then the mail transfer agent delivers that email to the user. So, for example, you are in the same company with someone, you want to send an email. Of course, because it's local, your emails are delivered instantly, right? But it's another ball game if these, these emails are to be sent over the internet to another domain. E.g., sending an email from Yahoo Mail to Gmail or other emails, right? So what happens here is that as far or as long as we are going over the internet, you need to publicly map your mail transfer agent with a public DNS record. I'll go again, you need to publicly map your mail transfer agent, e.g. of mail transfer agent, some of us have worked with it. Um, exchange servers, um, send mail. Um, you also have some in the cloud, AWS, SCS, uh, O365 and all that. So, for these to work, you need to have a public DNS server. Um, E.g., we have GoDaddy, which is almost the most popular. Then we have some other ones out there. For these DNS servers to send your emails, they first have to go through it to ensure that the record from your mail servers right, are genuine and they're legitimate. So it uses a set of records called the DNS resource records to ensure these, you know, these checks happen before your emails are delivered. I, I hope you are following that. If I'm sounding too technical, please forgive me. I'll go again. So your sender sends an email, right? It is received by a mail transfer agent. If the mail is supposed to be delivered locally, it sends it. If it's supposed to go over the internet, it routes it to a DNS server, which has public records. And then it checks through its own records to ensure that that server says, or that server is who or what it says it is, using some server records, which you would have predefined beforehand. I'm going to talk about the records next. Some of the records are one, we have the NX records. That MTA, that server, right, that you, that has taken delivery of email that you are sending, it has a name. So let's say, for example, we have diary of hackers. Whichever email server that is responsible for that diary of hackers domain is going to be populated in the NX record of the public DNS server. Then we have an A record. The A record maps the IP address, most times public IP address of that email server that is responsible for the diary of hackers domain to the domain name of the diary of hackers, right? I know you have a lot of questions, but you can just wait till the end. It's going to be a brief presentation. Then we have the CNN record that provides or act as an alias to the domain name, then we have the TXT record, we have the SPF record, and we have the TMAC record. So what happens is these last three records are used for email authentication. So we use them to prevent spoofing and spamming. So what happens is once the public DNS server runs a check through its record to see that 
whoever is sending this bill is not coming from this domain that has specified itself to be, then that email is tagged with spam email. Okay, so that's how it works. And once it passes this check, then it's going to send this information to the recipient's mail transfer. Remember the post office analogy to the other states' uh, post office, which is the user's mail transfer agent before the email is then delivered to the recipient. Okay, so this is just a simple working of how the email works. All right, so next we're going to take a look at threat landscape. Yeah, so we're um, going to look at the um, what affects the email, right? What threats uh, come up or are we used to seeing um, most times that we are out there working? Of course, the number one on the list is the spam message. So spam messages are unsolicited messages sent over the internet for either purpose of annoying me, which of course talks my list, or for you know very nefarious uh, purposes. Um, these spam messages could contain very malicious objects that could you know escalate to um, having you know damaging effect on your system or your corporation. So spams are either unsolicited, they could come in the form of gray words, you know, they could come in the form of ads and, you know, the likes of it. Then we have the business email compromise. According to the FBI, this is an email account compromise that is designed to exploit corporations and top-level executives. So what they do here is they target top-level executives with the intention of making or getting financial gains from them. Of course, the popular name comes to mind, Hush Puppy. He's exactly the attack he carries out. So he targets companies that he knows is able or they are vulnerable to such um, forms of attack. Remember, I talked about the human element. So it's not just enough to have sophisticated technologies, you need to train your users to be able to identify email. I think he was the one who uh, did the deal with one of these Italian clubs <laughs> to sell a player, to buy a player, or something like that. Now imagine how the email would look. It would look very legitimate for someone not to be able to tell the difference between his email and that of uh, a user that, you know, a fellow colleague who, you know, has an email on the network. And that leads us to the next um, threat, which is called the phishing or spare phishing attack. The phishing or the spare phishing attack often leads to the business email compromise attack. So a phishing attack is a form of social engineering where an attacker sends a fraudulent message, right? Most times, I'm sure we've seen these messages in our email. Our famous prince of Nigeria, right? The, um, white guys are used to that. So these are phishing attacks. They are just trying to, it, of course, it was derived from the word phishing. They're just trying to fish and hopefully get something out of you know, one of the users who click on those links. Right. Um, spare phishing is a targeted form of phishing, right? And that is what most times escalates to the business email compromise. So, for example, I know that, okay, there's a Chevron employee called Daniel David. I try as much as possible to get his email or just guess, you know, from the structure I've seen from other users, you know, who work with Chevron. And I try sending email to Daniel David because I know what the domain looks like. So I could say Daniel David at Chevron. Instead of using his O, I'm going to use Zell. So it almost looks similar to the Chevron domain, but it's a spoofed address. And then on suspecting users, once they click on that or reply that email, most times leads to you know getting the users to um, send money to them and then off they go. Okay. Then the last one um, we're going to talk about is the ransomware. Of 
course, we are used to this. Um, so what happens here is uh, most of these attacks, right, they come blended, they come in blended formats. So in one go or in one fell swoop, you could have someone targeting you, spare phishing, that leads to business email compromise or also leads to um, having ransomware deployed on your network, right? So these are just some of the popular threats that affect our emails. So an example of the um, spam message that hits our network is what you have on the screen. You can see someone is trying to um, impersonate a World Health Organization by sending a message and asking that particular user to click on the link. This, of course, is one of the ways of doing it. Um, for business email compromise, uh, so what happens here is you can see the user trying to spoof the CEO of Fortinet um, email and then trying to get to send that message to the CEO. The name of Fortinet CEO is Ken Z. So you can see the domain is wrong. So it's using KZ at fro instead of F-O-R, tnet.com and is sending an email to the CFO. So probably if that email goes through and the CFO is, of course, unsuspecting, maybe that day was stressful for him and he was maybe stressed out. He didn't even take a look at what was going on. He has an email before him authorizing him to send maybe like $100,000 to a particular account. He does that and off goes this bad guy. So these are some of the methods that this bad actors use. Again, I refer you to Hosh Poppy and Victor Zobi, right? For the business email compromise, right? Um, this is what happens in the timeline. I said that most times it emanates from spare phishing attacks. And when you have the user targeting some, um, the bad actor targeting some top level executives in the company he has, uh, you know, he has on his list or on his site. And then he tries sending an email. He could even pick up the phone to call them, you know, just ensure that he's unsuspecting, right? And that he means good. Then you can see in the third step that he's already exchanging um, mails the unsuspecting user, in this case, the financial director. And if the guy is not careful, the guy wires him money, right? And then off he goes. We've seen these happen a lot of times. All right? So I spoke about the phishing attack before, and this has even um, escalated to um, phishing, which is a voice phishing, where you have someone pick up the phone to call you. Snishing, which is SMS phishing, where well, of course that is very uh, common around here. You have the user send you a uh, text message saying you have won a particular lottery or whatever. And then if you want that particular gift, you have to call a number or you have to click on the link, right? Then we have farming. So farming through. Um, installation of malicious code on your system. Say maybe they send you a link installed uh, and that if the code was triggered and installed on your system. This will redirect your traffic to fake websites. Okay, maybe you are trying to access gtbank.com. It's going to try to redirect you to another website maybe that looks like gtbank.com. And then you have, of course, your money is stolen. Okay. Um, spare phishing attack, on the other hand, is a targeted form of phishing attack. They have people in sites they want to um, uh, exploit. And then from there, it escalates to things like the business email compromise attack. All right. And then the ransomware, which I've um, explained um, much earlier. So, how do we protect ourselves against these threats? I have a um, spectrum before me, right? 
Um, so it gives us an idea of how to approach this. Now, away from this, I had earlier mentioned that, remember, the technology bit is just one part of the protection or prevention approach. There's also the user part. I have a spectrum on the screen here, and this gives us like a, a, methodolog a methodology and approach to securing our email infrastructure. So on, at the bottom, you can see IP reputation, right? Um, so at the top of the layer, right, we have IP addresses. Um, we need to be able to, because IPs are used for communication. First, we need to be able to filter the kind of IPs that our email servers are communicating with, right? So um, whatever solution that you are going to deploy, either for your um, organization, you need to be able to get that the IP it's communicating with is a clean IP. So you need to be able to um, integrate your um, solution to thread fit that has um, blacklisted IPs. For example, we have, um, I think, the spam house. That's one of, them, one of the most popular ones around. So whenever anyone is trying to communicate with you, you should know that this guy is coming, this guy's IPs are blacklisted, and somewhere around the world, someone has blacklisted that IP, and it should never have access or have any form of communication with you. Then on the spectrum, on the left-hand side, you're moving from the left to the right. Um, if you have no good um, emails, emails that your has been defined by your email security system, to have or protect, right, or have the have the um, exchanges with, and of course you know that those domains are on the safe list, right? Then probably goods, maybe like use letters, these are not only letters that we get all the time, right? You could have maybe, of course, still the same domain, or you could blacklist those uh, um, new letter domains. Then if we have a completely unknown um, domain. Um, we have these um, domain generators that go with them that back bad actors use these days. On the fly, they can start generating domains that have never been created before. And most of the time, our systems or email systems or security systems don't recognize them. And because they are not classified in any form or any way, they are allowed to, to have conversation or communication with your email or your users because your security system doesn't know what they are. They've never been classified. They are just new, like fresh of the tape grid. And then you have your users, you know, communicating with these guys, and of course they can do some damages there. Now in that case, right, you have to have um, a blended um, security uh, approach to this. If the enemy, the adversary, right, can, come up with blended attacks, you know, have uh, spare phishing mixed with BBC and have a little sprinkle of uh, somewhere on the, on the mix. Then of course, it's also right for us to have our own multi-layer defense strategies to mitigate this attack, right? Um, I'll see in the next uh, um, slide, we'll see how that works. And that again, the approach is called the advanced threat protection approach. Then for somewhat suspicious mail communication, of course, we've got several techniques like sender reputation. We've got several techniques, sorry, I think uh, that's the one. We've got several techniques like uh, sender reputation using SPS and then um, to mark. We want to be able to tell that these emails are genuine. They are coming from where they say they are. Um, so what happens is once they are not classified as uh, spam, at least the system should be able to quarantine them. Yeah. Then we've got very suspicious emails, and then um, we can have um, known bad threats. You know. Um, stopped by our uh, antivirus system. So, so you can see the relationship between just sending an email to the detonation of that particular threat and then 
the effect it's going to have on our network or our, or our systems, right? So again, that's a relationship. Like they say, there's no one single threat to mitigating um, your attack. So it's got to be multi layered threat, okay? Um, all right, so um, I was just going to give a pictorial um, depiction or representation of how we stop um, or how we use the IP reputation service to mitigate the error. So what happens here is uh, this is just a snippet or a screenshot from one of our systems, right? Where you can stop emails at the IP level geographically. So if I don't want threats, or I don't want to communicate with anyone from China, I can block communication from happening. And if you remember, there are some websites that we cannot access, you know, because we are in this region. So similar things are done to them, yeah? So all they do is just geographically, you know, block traffic that is coming from that region. The same thing applies to um, the email. So if I don't want emails coming from certain regions in the world or countries, I can block them at the IP level. Then the advanced threat prevention or protection that I talked about before. So for potentially unwanted emails that um, we are not sure of, E.g., I said a generated domain today, right? That has a, an, a domain that has been generated today, right? That uh, no one is suspicious of can go past most email security systems. And then in that instance, what we try to do or what it's recommended to do is integrate your email other threat detection or protection solution. So there's a particular solution that is called the sandbox. It helps or improves the accuracy of detection and ultimately protect them from being exploited. So what happens is once the email is sent, right, comes to your mailbox, there's an attachment to it, your mailbox or your email system is going to send that attachment to a sandbox, right? This sandbox is a simulated environment, like your Windows environment and all that. So what it's going to do is it's going to trigger that particular email file that is suspicious to detonate whatever payload it has. So the environment looks like your Windows environment. So the malicious file, right? Let's say it's a Microsoft document with a macro file that's infected. We we'll think it's a normal user environment. And then it will try to detonate itself. But again, it doesn't know that it's in a false or a simulated environment. In fact, we even have threats these days that evade simulated environment. Right? But that's a discussion for another day. So once the payload detonates, gets detonated, then these advanced threat protection solution or the sandbox now sends a risk rating to the email system to say this file is infected then you can drop the file and then it is stripped off the email that is sent to the user so this is just a summary of how the advanced threat protection with integration to the sandbox technology works okay there's also another one called the web browser isolation it's also part of the integration with your email security system but this works differently. Um, so this is more targeted at your email, your web browser, right? Um, most times you have links that come with your email. Either links are embedded in the attachment or attached files or on the body of the email. So what the web browser isolation does is it redirects and creates a vacuum between your own web browser and that particular URL. So you will think that when you click on that particular URL that comes into your email, you are actually seeing it in your own web browser. But no, that URL has been opened in another environment, but appears as if it's your own environment with its active content stripped off. So if anything malicious happens, it's not running directly on your own browser, but it appears as if it's running on your own browser. 
Okay. So um, a lot of vendors or a lot of technology companies are, of course, heavily invested in this right now. So you can't tell the difference between the two sites, the screenshot you have on the screen. One is the regular browser, yeah? The other one is what is presented by the web isolation technology. So what happens behind the scene? So you can see that all the active content that we have on the regular browser has been stripped off and replaced by scripts that are been defined or that have been replaced those active content with its or its own. I'll go again. So you think that you are actually browsing from your own browser, let's say Google Chrome. But no, what you are seeing are images of or content from the web isolation to um, solution that appears as if it's your own browser. So in case maybe you have um mistakenly go to URL by very much, very much. It's not happening on your own browser or system. It's happening on a separate container. So these are ways to mitigate, you know, or approach to uh, help you mitigate threats to your email infrastructure. Okay? And it's a wrap. All right, all right. It's a wonderful session, short, direct, comprehensive, and um, insightful. That's what I will um, say about, that's what I have to say about the session. Thank you so very much, everyone, for joining. Uh, I enjoyed the session. I hope you as well enjoyed the session. So make sure you follow us on YouTube, subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, everywhere so that you can get updates on when our next events are coming up. Thank you so much, sir, for your great knowledge that you shared for us. We really appreciate that. My pleasure. All right. All right. All right. So that will be all for my end. Bye-bye, guys. All right. Bye, guys.